Hello, hello, hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining, wherever you're joining from. Good to see everybody here. Looks like we've got people still showing up on the map back there, which is always fun. I'm back from NAB, mostly recovered, not 100% recovered yet. It is always an adventure. Uh, yeah, so we got a lot to talk about. There was a lot going on at NAB, as always, and uh, we have... We have some time today to catch up on what what we saw. What and we can talk about some of the Black Magic stuff. A lot of stuff from Black Magic. Too much to go into in one stream or one video. Even um, it seems like they had quite a backlog of stuff to announce. But yeah, let's let's jump in. So if you have a question, start your message with the letter Q, and that will um, that will sort it onto my screen here, so it's easier for me to find in in the chat and I need I, I lost my graphic for that for some reason um but yeah start your start your question with Q and it'll, it'll it'll filter it out here Michael says I just want my black magic replay yesterday yeah that was that was really um really impressive I spent a while just at the console trying it out and getting a sense for it uh without reading any manuals of course which was mildly useful uh, as soon as the guy came over and gave me a demo of it, which I recorded and posted, then it made a lot more sense. Um, it's really powerful. You kind of really do need their keyboard for it. It, I think you can do something without the keyboard, like the controller for it, but the controller is really what makes that thing shine. So I'm going to hopefully do some more videos on that later because that is uh, very cool. Very cool. 
Uh, Christopher says, was there really nothing new from Magewell? So they didn't have like a new director mini style thing. But what they did do is um, they launched a rack, basically a rack case for their Pro Convert products. So you know how they have all these, um, all these Pro Convert, the Pro Convert line is all these little converters that do things like NDI to HDMI, 4K, SDI, et cetera, et cetera. They're all these little boxes. Where's their pictures of it? It's it's this little box, right? And what they did is, let's see, is this on their website yet? Is it this? Yes. So what they did is they have this new 2U rack box and it has these little these little slots. Now it doesn't take the actual Pro Convert like the existing stuff, but they've taken that hardware and put it onto boards that go in these slots. And so you just get like what is it, ten slots where you can put these cards into, and uh, the features of these cards are exactly the same as their existing line of Pro Convert stuff. So yeah, so here's their. Um, it looks like they have four out right now. So they have these four different converters. Um, and essentially what the what the rack is doing is it's powering them um, and cooling them. But each of them has their own network jack still, which is an interesting design decision. But it was apparently something they um, got feedback on from people. And um, people wanted to be able to give each card its own network connection so that they can control the network uh, the, on their own instead of like basically shoving a network switch into this box where they would have less control over it, which makes sense. So that is that's the deal with Magewell's new thing. Um, definitely a cool thing because like I have th now three cards in that rack or, or pro converts in that rack and they're just like it's a giant mess back there. So yeah, that's cool. Uh, let me scroll through the chat real quick. Tech Condo says jet lag galore here, and maybe it was cool. Yeah, uh, Tech Condo. I guess that means you're back in in the Netherlands. Um, I just ran into Tech Condo in Portland, actually. Um, Clear Life Media says I'm excited. Got gifted the two ME 4K constellation. Excited to put it in our trailer. That's cool. Fun. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, that's a that's a good box. I think that's a pretty solid entry for four for into the 4k world because the the 4me 4k is nine thousand dollars which is a lot uh but now the 2me 4k is thirty eight hundred dollars which is still a lot but it's like i feel like it's a little bit more achievable and um weirdly it's actually the same price as the hd version of the 4k which is the one that i bought a while ago um so yeah, I think that's a I think that's a good one for for a lot of people. This one I still think is weird because uh, there's still no super source in the 4K version, which is like, why, why not? I mean, I guess price, but like, it seems really weird. Anyway, this one seems like a good a good option for a lot of people. TVJ says modular frames are big in the professional TV world and a lot of cards have their own RJ45 jacks. It makes sense. There used to be a standard that called Open Gear that Blackmagic had cards for. It was a great concept that I think fell off for some reason. I I remember seeing that on their website a long time ago, and then yeah, I never never really looked into it much. Christopher says, with the new Blackmagic 4K constellations, besides total ports in and out, what's the benefit of two MEs over one ME? Well, the big benefit is super source because um, like this is super source is the thing that I'm using to make this layout right now of my picture next to this screen scale down and there is no super source in the one ME which again makes no sense to me um, I don't know why they did that because all of these are also um, one ME's right these are all they don't have two ME's in here so these are all one ME's and the extreme has super source and these have super source so why didn't they add it to the rack mount one um, so 
yeah, other than the total ports, if you want to do this kind of layout side by side in your streams, you're going to have to go with the 2ME rack mount version if you're going with a rack mount. Still, seems like a weird decision. No weather today, maybe in back order. Oh yeah, I forgot to turn the weather on. Let's see. Let's see if it works today. I think so. Let's make sure it's reloaded because sometimes it gets stuck. Great, that should, that should work. So if you've said where you're from, in the beginning here, then the weather forecast for all the lo those locations should be showing up in the little ticker. I agree that it's weird that there's no super source in the one ME. Um, oh, I mean, the other the other advantage, of course, is yes, as Andre says, using two MEs, which is um, not necessarily something everybody needs in their productions, but it can be really helpful. One thing you can do with it is it's basically like having two ATEMs inside the box where there are two totally independent canvases and then you can output those over uh, different SDI ports on the back. So one thing you can do with that is you can have your, your program mix for your stream going with, with like your camera and your slides and whatever uh, going out one of the SDI ports and you can use the other ME just to run a screen. And then instead of only hard cuts like you know, you can always run a screen by using, where did my software control go? The ATEM software control app keeps crashing on my computer. It's interesting. Uh, it was open a second ago. So like I can always go and change with the output, say like, okay, here's this SDI port number four, I can change it to a different input. And if I'm doing that, obviously with like a companion or some sort of uh, automation, I can change what's going out that port so I can feed the monitor in a room, the slides or graphics or a remote guest video or whatever. Um, but if you only have a, a 1ME switcher like an Extreme or uh, the, the 1ME rack mount, you're limited to just hard cuts on that, right? So if you have a second ME, you can actually do things like layouts or crossfades or uh, chroma keying and things like that. So um, that's another thing you can do with a second, if you have a second ME on your switcher. Um, and yes, what you're doing is correct. If you have a, a multiple ME, then uh, they chain together in one direction, but not the other. So if you look at mine, I have in my ME1 section, I can choose what's going out ME1, I can make it the super source like right now, or I could say, actually, I want you to show what's on ME2 or ME3. But if you go up to ME2, you don't have the ability to show ME1, it's only the sort of downstream ones. So um, ME4 can be displayed on any of the other ones higher, ME3 can be displayed on the higher ones like that. Um, so that can be that starts getting hard to keep track of in your head if you're if you're switching things that way. Uh, the sort of simpler way to to start is just using the the Emmys for totally separate programs, where you're doing like yeah feeding the slides or feeding two different streaming encoders. Like you're sending one thing to Facebook and one thing to Instagram um, or YouTube or whatever, uh, where you're sending different graphics. Okay, cool. Lots of good questions coming in. Oh. Tarek says, 2ME doesn't have MADI, only 4ME. Yeah, that's that's been the case for, for the HD ones also, which is, I don't, again, I don't really understand why they did it that way, but, um, but it would be, it'd be nice if the 2ME had MADI because I can't even get all the channels from all 40 inputs into the mixer because I have a 32 channel mixer, which is actually 16 stereo video feeds. So they should have added it to the 2ME. Anyway. Um, okay, cool. Don't forget to put a Q in front of your question so I can 
so I can get to them. I'm going to catch up here in a second. Am I planning on posting my NAB stuff to YouTube? Yeah, so I posted all these videos on Instagram. They were uh, posted as Instagram Reels. So if you're following me on Instagram, you will have seen them. Uh, and just a reminder for my Instagram, that is my Instagram page. Um, so these are all the interviews that are all about 90 seconds. Um, I reposted the ones that Joseph did as well. So these are a mix of me and Joseph. Here's his on top of a green screen, which was funny. Um, so here you can, this is the demo of the Resolve uh, replay feature. It's really funny to see which of these got better views than others. Um, the road one was the first one I did and it's one of the top top ones there with 20K plays. Um, but yeah, you can go take a look at all these for the quick little uh, quick clips of what was going on. Uh, I am posting, planning on posting these to YouTube in horizontal format. So the whole idea with this project was um, and the reason these are all already out is because so this was uh, sponsored by Atomos using their Atomos uh, Ninja recorder, which has the camera to cloud connection. So it's um, so it's the little recorder on top of the camera and um, the camera we had vertical again, uh, and it's recording 6K open gate, which means the resolution of that rectangle is actually wider than 4k is uh wide <laughs> so 4k wide is like 38 20 or whatever um so the 6k short direction is already wider than that so we rotate the camera the ninja on top of the camera is getting that vertical video uploading to frame io and i can actually show you what those look like in frame io um, so that's got, we had a backpack with a cellular connection on it and that backpack worked really well this time. Um, so like as soon as we hit stop it, as soon as we stop recording, the video is just up on frame.io already. So here is, oh, let me go to the raw, the raw folder. Uh, so in cloud devices, here's day one video. So here's all the clips. Um, the editor, so we had an editor, a remote editor on the East Coast who was watching this folder. He was sorting them as they were coming in. So that's why they're in folders already. Um, but they just got dumped like all into this one, this one folder. So he was fil sorting these into to folders. So here you can see the um, vertical videos, right? It's like, it's like rotated because the camera was turned sideways. Um, so this is the video that we recorded. And as you can see, the aspect ratio is um, not 16 by 9. It's 3 by 2, right? So this dimension up and down is actually wider than a 4K video. So when I turn this and crop a horizontal crop out of it, it'll be better than more than 4K already. So it'll still be great quality when I re-edit these for horizontal format. But these were vertical format. So what the editor was doing was as these were coming in, he was just working on them immediately and editing down into short clips. So that's what we posted to Instagram uh, was these short little clips. So I saw a question in here, which is um, <laughs> relevant. Um, where was it? Christopher, why, did, why didn't you post them as YouTube shorts in real time instead of Instagram, which none of us use? Um, correct. Uh, the problem is that YouTube shorts are limited to 60 seconds, which we tried, we did that last year, posted it to both. And it was really hard to get these edited down to under 60 seconds. So either we ended up posting a cropped version, just a trimmed, you know, ended early version, which is weird. Or we um, had to just cut out more of the have the editor do it, have the editor cut out more of the content, which wasn't great. And we weren't very happy with that. So made the decision this year to only post to Instagram. Uh, sadly, I'm sorry. Um, maybe we'll try to figure out a solution for that next year. But um, I mean, one option is to not post them as uh, shorts on YouTube and just post them as videos. But then it's like kind of weird to post a 90 second 
video on Instagram. So, yeah. <laughs> Michael says, I'm offended. I use Instagram. Well, I'm glad you were watching. Um, yeah, it's tough. It's definitely tough. Uh, but that is something we could definitely try to improve next year because this was, um, we, we, we learned a lot from last year and implemented a lot of that stuff this year and it worked really well. Um, Jim says, excellent job by you and Joseph on all the videos this year. You guys really got it down pat. Thanks. Uh, it definitely helped having, uh, having an editor. This year's editor was fantastic. He did such a good job. He was just on top of it. As soon as the videos were coming in, he just, most of the time it was his, it was the first edit was good enough. And, and at most there was like two things I had to ask him to change on a video. So as he was doing these edits, he would, he would do the edits and then post them back to Frame.io in this for review folder. So I'd be sitting on the show floor and um, running between booths or, or while Joseph's filming something, I'd be, um, you know, reviewing these and then would go through and um, the be like, okay, I actually want to use this other shot in the beginning or, or trim out this phrase that wasn't relevant or whatever, that, that kind of stuff. And then post, post back notes in the frame IO comments. And, um, he would upload a new version pretty quickly after. And, um, yeah, it was great. So then as soon as, as soon as it was good enough, I would download it on my phone. Thankfully my internet on my phone held up pretty well on the show. I uh, download that. They were about a hundred, 50 megabytes each or so posted to Instagram tagged a bunch of people, which took a long time to remember all the tags and all the, all that stuff you have to do. Um, but yeah, worked pretty well. The, okay. Let me see if there's any, any other questions about the workflow. Yeah, I agree. YouTube needs to extend shorts. I wish they would just at least match Instagram because then <laughs> you don't have to do a separate, cut for for YouTube. Um, silly. So funny about YouTube shorts being 60 seconds, they supposedly came to compete with TikTok, which can be 15 seconds to three minutes. Yeah, it makes no sense. Um, the Gwen says what worked and didn't work with this year's production workflow? Good question. We took a lot of notes last year on, on things. And last year, the challenges were, um, it was just Joseph and I and the, and the one remote editor and the, um, the problem was that because it was just Joseph and I on the floor, we were both always busy, either filming or being on camera. And the, that meant that there was like zero downtime. So we were running around to booths learning about the product, doing an interview, filming, and somehow reviewing the footage. So we got behind pretty quick. Plus last year, the editor was a lot slower. Uh, so this year, the editor was much faster and took fewer revisions back and forth, but we also had a camera person. So Atomos um, sent one of the people at their booth to run, to be camera operator for us. So he was filming us, which meant that while Joseph also had speaking gigs, so he was just like, way busier than me. But while Joseph was in the speaking gig, I was running around the floor with a camera guy filming stuff. And then as soon as Joseph was out of his speaking slots, the camera guy would go follow him. I would get a break. And that meant either reviewing stuff, posting stuff, um, or going to booths to, to go scope things out. And also we had uh, another person who, who was like a scout. And his job was, um, like most of the stuff, most of the interviews on Sunday I had pre-booked. So I had like emailed people throughout the week being like, Hey, I'm at NAB. I want to do a little quick interview. Let's pick a time slot on Sunday. So most of my Sunday was already scheduled. So on Sunday, the scout was in the other hall walking around to the booths, texting photos like, Hey, is this interesting? Should I set up an appointment with this person? So that was fantastic because it meant we could kind of be in two places at once. So he was setting up interviews for Monday uh, and had the contacts with, with all the booths. So then by the time I would show up on Monday, uh, all I had to do was be like, 
hey, I'm here to film the interview. And they already knew everything. They already knew like what the project was and who was going to be on camera. And like, oh my gosh, that was just like, it was, it was so helpful. So that worked really well. Um, what didn't work well? Um, I, let me see. I took some notes. Where did I put them? Well, not posting to YouTube, for one. I would like to find a way to post them to YouTube. Somehow, I don't, but obviously I'm not going to do two edits of all these, right? So, what... So that's one thing I would like to fix. Um, the... One thing was, if a product is actually new to me, if, I, if I'm not actually familiar with the product, it took longer than I wanted to kind of get up to speed and formulate the questions. So a lot of the products were like straightforward, like the road interview mic. I hadn't seen it before, but I I can see very clearly what it is, that it's a road wireless go transmitter in a, in a handle, right? So I know exactly what that does. And that means that if I'm already familiar with a wireless go or wireless pro, I know kind of the scope of what it does. And, um, the scope of what it does and what questions to ask because of that. But for something that's like completely new, um, beyond just like asking, what is this product? Tell me about the product. It took a while to like learn enough about the product to actually ask a question. So that is something, um, that's something. And then the other thing that we could have done better was This one's tough. So in we made we made a decision which worked well both last year and this year to where the interviewer, me or Joseph, always held the microphone. So if we're asking the person a question, we're gonna point the mic at them, but we hold on to the microphone. And the reason is that otherwise they end up just sort of talking forever. And the uh they end up just like going on and on and on. So it's a lot harder to like physically grab the microphone back to cut them off. It's a lot easier to cut them off if you just are holding the mic and you can just bring it back, right? And that gesture is easier and they see it too. And it's a lot, yeah, so that worked. Um, the problem is that that doesn't lend itself well to quick back and forths. So if I was like, uh, oftentimes towards the end of the video, I'd be like, you know, thanks for, thanks for, chatting, this looks great. And they'd be like, yeah, sure. And see you next time, whatever. And that back and forth doesn't work. So I want to figure out a solution to that, which might be just I wear a lav and use the audio from the lav all the time. And the interview mic is just for the person. Could be. I'm not 100% sure on that. But I, we actually did have I was wearing a lav and that was our backup audio track. Um, and he used it a couple of times in the edits, but not super often. So that was one thing. Um, the other thing that didn't work well, which was not our fault, um, some of the booths, big brands, Sony and Canon, um, they wanted their PR team to approve the videos before we posted. Unfortunately, those we only filmed on Wednesday and we hadn't filmed them earlier in the week, which meant on the last day of the event, we were scrambling to uh, film them, edit them and get approval from their staff. And that did not work well. So if we do those again that require approval, we need to film those earlier in the week. Um, otherwise, they get they get um, delayed. So that was that was something. Um, yeah. It is great that we accrue this year, Gwen. Yes. Um, Bailey says, I'm going to try and come next year. Would love to see the people behind the cameras and emails. Cool. That'd be, that'd be super fun. You should definitely come. Mark says, since you had to travel light to NAB, what gear did you give up that you wish you had? You know what? I honestly, um, I brought too much. <laughs> so Joseph brought the whole rig we were using for the project. And 
uh, as always, um, I overestimated my capacity for for doing things at an AB and um, did not use my interview mic that I brought at all and uh, didn't really use my ZV-1 because the main reason I brought it was for doing other interviews when I was not doing the, the main interviews. Did not do any interviews other than the project. Um, and I think that actually is a testament to how well that workflow went because we were so busy filming interviews that like I just didn't have time or energy to film anything outside of that. So I filmed some B-roll with the camera, which I also used my um, Pocket 3 for B-roll. I was trying to get you know videos of Joseph behind the scenes and stuff. Um, that would have been totally fine. I did not need the ZV-1, so I could have only brought the Pocket 3. Uh, I did bring the NC360. That was useful, fun little group shots and stuff. Um, there wasn't anything that I wish I had brought. Um, oh, the one thing I did bring was the the uh, director mini for the Sunday morning stream, which was only eight minutes last week. Sorry, it was so short, but we were like, you know, it's chaos. The show was about to open. I uh, had to get James had to go to the booth, Adamos booth. Uh, we had to. Joseph had to go and run to his first speaking slot, that kind of stuff. So um, the and then the other so for that rig, oh yeah, I made a whole thing about about that rig, which I wanted to talk about. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but yeah. Okay, so the let me see if there's any question or any chatter in here about this. Um, Clear Life Media says, why not post them as is? I know it doesn't go to shorts, but I think we would watch them either way if it's short or not. Plus make more money from YouTube on regular videos than shorts. True. I, maybe it's worth trying that next year. Um, maybe what we could do is have the editor... He can probably do a horizontal cut of it. This guy was so good that like he could probably manage to do a horizontal cut for YouTube while doing the vertical cut for Instagram. So that's something we could try. Um, and if that's the case, then we could try posting the 90 second horizontal video to YouTube at the same time as just a regular video. So, um, I'm going to make a note of this. I am curious how those videos would do on YouTube because they're like, you, the YouTube algorithm knows that shorts are a different thing than regular videos, but it doesn't really think about the difference between a 90 second regular video and a 10 minute regular video. So like, I don't want those videos to like tank the stats of everything else. I don't know. I might be overthinking it, but um, it might be worth an experiment. Anyway, it is more work. I, I don't think I would want to post vertical, not shorts to YouTube. You can, there's no rule that says the aspect ratio has to be 16 by nine, but that seems weird. I'm curious if that would be weird for you, but I would expect uh, a horizontal one on YouTube if it wasn't a short. For YouTube, rather than the horizontal 90 second, could you do a daily video that compiles any videos you're posted for that day? There isn't really time. I'm trying to figure out how I would fit that in. So the timing of it's tough. So First, the editor was on the East Coast, which was actually a disadvantage because he was three hours later than us. So if the show goes until we were filming until what, like 5 p.m., sometimes or 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. I think it was 5 p.m. We'd be filming all the way until five. So the last video for the day would get uploaded at five. And then that's eight o'clock for the editor. So at that point, the editor is working kind of late and uh, trying to get that video turned around. And then um, we need to review it and post it. We also learned that posting things in the evening, I'm gonna make a note about that one, posting in the evening 
uh, got way fewer views. Um, so actually what we need to do is wait on those and post them in the morning. So a daily video, a daily recap would be like another thing for the editor to do. Another thing for us to approve. And then it's a bigger file to upload. So yeah, I'm not sure how we would do that. Maybe you need an on-site compilation video editor that can gather the content throughout the day. Another person would solve it for sure. Um, but that's going to get expensive now. Yeah, shorts are a separate bucket for the algo. You might not want any second videos on your main channel. Exactly. That's kind of my thought. So, like, I don't know how much I want to test the algorithm on that. You need to tell them no pre-approval pre before posting. If they want coverage, they will agree to that. Yes, that is true for, for most things. This was a special case, which I can't get into why, but but yes. <laughs> um, I agree that it's not worth anybody's time if PR people want to approve it. I'm not going to get into the, 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 the details of, of why we had to do that. Um, it was also the reason that it was all the last day. So I'm um, going to try to avoid that situation next year. How about a summary of reels? Three videos side by side, left video plays, other two pause, the middle video, then right videos. That's what I did in the in the recap uh, for last year. Where was that? Um, the... This was the, the recap video. So this was, oh no, this was the horizontal re-edit. Joseph did it. That's, that's where I remember seeing it. He did. Yeah, exactly. So he did, he did this where and then it would go play the Synology one. And then it would go over there. Kind of cute. Um, when did he post that? That was posted on April 24th. I feel like that was after the after the show. <laughs> Sony and Canon do not need YouTubers. Yes, again, not not the reason we did that. Um could the editor Begin to compile throughout the day. It's just as soon as they finish one video, add it to the end of the timeline, can reduce the re-editing time, not upload or approval time. Possibly. Um, depending on if we're doing horizontal re-edits or not. Okay, let me see if there's any other... <laughs> Any other chatter about this? Never let go of the microphone. Yeah. Uh, Jim says, if they're good, they come armed with a well-rehearsed elevator pitch. Uh, true. True. I like to get a little more than the elevator pitch. Like, why it's relevant to people who watch my channel specifically. Um... Sven says, the quick back and forth is usually the part that doesn't add much to a short info video, in my opinion. That's interesting. I feel like that makes it more interesting. Otherwise, why are you watching my, my video? Why not just watch their press release? I don't know. Media Rex, hi from Las Vegas. Gwen says, I usually bring too much gear on shoots too because it sucks so much when you forget something. It's true. Yeah, it's true. If posting in the evening isn't good for reach anyway, why not let them start in the morning on their time and posting videos in the mornings after you get up? It's pretty much what we ended up doing. But yeah, if maybe we don't need to, to keep the editor running late. 
You should watch the Gotham Sound videos for how they did audio in their interviews. Cool, I will. Uh, did I check out the Keyleview R1? It launched a year ago, but seemed to have issues with stuttering. I wonder if they fix, fix it now. I didn't make it to the Keyleview booth, and I'm really sad. Um, what happened with that? There was... I had wanted to... Oh, they were in... They were in South Hall Upper Floor, which was... I was mostly in Central Hall which is where most of the stuff that's relevant to me lives. Some of the stuff is in South Hall Lower, which is where Black Magic is. Um, but I only made it over there one day and then was back in Central. And Kila View ended up, they were, they were just too far away to get to. I know it sounds weird, but like when you're running around with the, I wasn't carrying the camera rig, I was holding the tripod, but like the camera guys, um, camera guy is uh you know lugging this camera rig around. I don't want to make him run back and forth across the halls and uh so yeah it's like we have to like be strategic about where we're going and uh make sure that we're like staying in the same general area per uh per day but but yeah uh, uh, I was sad to to miss that miss them at the booth. Regarding the back and forth, I meant the exchange of niceties. Oh yeah, I didn't give a good example of of what I was talking about, but um, yes, I agree. We don't need. Hi, how are you doing? How's your NAB so far on the interview? Um, <laughs> be honest you're like a kid at disney and you couldn't see it all it's true i could not see it all i didn't even make it into west hall other than walking into it after the live stream on sunday booking it straight for central and then at the very end rgb link was in west hall i couldn't find them because they were like at a distributor's booth so they didn't show up in the search in the app when i was searching um but i managed to at least like go by and say hi to them uh on my way out of the hotel on wednesday so I uh, didn't get an interview with them either. Bailey says, random question with your newsletter. Does it make any difference if I actually view the email rather than just see it and delete it? Normally I see the subject line and go to YouTube. No, I don't care. It's not like it's my own email platform. It's not like a, I'm getting email stats by you viewing it. Spence says, why I watch your videos? Because you select interesting stuff. If I watch all press release videos, that wouldn't be needed, but I don't want to sift through all that. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. So th think of me as like a like a filter, trying to filter filter the interesting stuff. Yeah, okay. So even if I'm only doing... Press, press release talking points from a booth. It's fine because at least I've done like the selection. I guess that's what that means. Um, Art says, I've been to Nam a couple times and it's the same thing. You can't get to everything. I almost went to that one year. It was before I was doing YouTube though. Um, and now I can't remember why I didn't go, but probably was fine. Okay. I did want to talk about the streaming rig for the show. So at the beginning of the show on Sunday, which was um, interestingly at almost the exact same time as my normal stream here, I did a pre-show live stream with Joseph outside of the show floor, which uh, looked like this if you were watching on YouTube, and it looked like just this middle part if you were watching on Instagram. And... Um, this was our little say hi before the show and explain what's going on. That's a face. <laughs> um, so this camera filming this is the Sony ZV-1, and the stream is running to the Major Well Director Mini. Uh, 
we I was originally planning on using the, these little um, planter boxes that were across the street, so I could set my laptop on that, and then they got taken over by flags for the show. Um, so we had to just sort of stand in the weird corner here. The other problem was that it was super windy, so like the laptop kept getting blown out of my hand as I was holding it. Um, so trying to figure out a solution for that for next year, but the problem was that I didn't have a vendor badge, so I couldn't get into the expo hall until 10. And we needed to do this like starting at 9 or 9.30. Um, so next time I need to do a vendor badge so I can get in the expo hall early and then we can do the show from in there and it'll be a lot easier. Anyway, what I wanted to do was a quick little welcome to NAB. We're about to kick off. Here's the streaming rig we're using. Um, live stream from there, which is always a challenge. And what I ended up doing, I thought was really cool. Uh, so Matrix Director Mini, I brought with me because it's so tiny, but also because it can go into vertical mode, which is um, not something that most other encoders can do. And the reason that was important was because, um, so I had the camera turned vertically for Instagram, um, rather than having the camera horizontal and then having Instagram crop out the middle sliver. So this was in vertical mode. This was pushing an SRT feed into my studio. So I wanted to post, I wanted to broadcast this on my Instagram, Joseph's Instagram, and my YouTube channel. Three streams. And I didn't want to have to push three streams from the show floor, from the expo hall, internet over my cell phone. And I didn't want to have to push that up to all three platforms. So like, you know, this can just do streaming to multiple platforms, but I didn't want to have to require the bandwidth for that. So instead, I pushed an SRT feed out of that into my studio, which is what this box is showing. This is a the Magewell Pro Convert receiving the stream. So that's the feed from the Director Mini. Uh, why Director Mini versus the Yellow Box? Because of the vertical canvas situation. So Yellow, Yellow Box Ultra has a horizontal canvas in its streaming mode. Um, but if you put it into vertical mode, it's actually an Android device and it runs the Instagram app, which means I can only push to one place. So if they added a, a vertical streaming mode to the Yellow Box, it would work. Uh, but also the Ultra is a lot bigger than this. And I like how small this is. And again, I had to go to Italy before the show. So I wanted as little as possible with me. Anyway, so Director Mini is pushing an SRT feed. SRT for one, because it handles bad network connections better. Um, and so I could send uh, H.265, which is more uh, compressed. So I send tiniest stream across the worst connection down to the studio. And from there, build it back up into a stream that gets pushed to Instagram and YouTube. So I had this getting received here. And then basically, um, I created this, this layout in the ATEM. So this is a, this is a uh, super source layout, a background image, and then two cameras. I had one camera pointed at the rack. And I had this feed coming from the Magewell cropped in. Um, you'll notice that the Magewell is receiving it as a 16 by 9 horizontal and giving me only the middle chunk. Um, that wasn't exactly what I wanted to, how I wanted to do it, but it ended up being the only way that I could really put together on such short notice. It worked fine. So essentially, uh, this layout was getting created in my ATEM, which you can see on the ATEM screen here, and then getting fed into the Epifan Pearl Nano, which is down here, because this can broadcast to multiple places. So the... Um, the Pearl Nano was pushing this stream to YouTube and Instagram. And if you give a horizontal video to Instagram, it'll crop the middle part. So on Instagram, all you saw was the middle chunk. And on YouTube, you saw the behind the scenes on the sides as well, which was kind of cool. Um, it worked really well. I have a little gear diagram of this, which I can also give the link in the chat. Uh, the Here is the gear diagram. So on the show floor side, I had my ZV-1 Pocket 3, which honestly I didn't really need at that point because um, it was, because we had the ZV-1 in such a wide angle, it was the same 
Field of View was the Pocket 3 anyway. Um, also, it was blowing over in the wind, so couldn't really use that shot. Um, I had a travel router with me, which was VPN into my studio. That was the other cool part. So this travel router had the VPN connection, which meant the Director Mini was pushing to the local IP address of my Visual Pro Convert um, over the VPN, which worked. And then I had my phone, my iPhone, wirelessly connected to the, the hub, sharing its wireless camera to the Majewell Director Mini. That part didn't work as well as I had hoped. Um, so if you scroll through here, you'll find a section where I cut over to my phone camera, um, showing a close-up. It worked okay, but you can see it's a little glitchy. Um, sometimes like there's definitely frame drops and there's like the weird compression artifacts and that's actually the link from the phone to the director mini um probably because the travel router wasn't i mean it worked okay like okay yeah there's another glitch it was okay oh this is a bad one wow um this gave me a wireless handheld camera so i need to find a better link for that so i don't i don't know exactly why that link wasn't stable enough, um, but that's the next thing to solve. And, um, but I want to be able to do close-ups of this. Yeah. I'm glad it worked as designed. The multi-streams and different aspect ratios is such a treacherous minefield. Just got to test, just got to test. What kind of travel router peplink with its bonding? No, this is just the um, GL iNet um, barrel, I think is what it's called. Let me, let me find the link. No. Uh, oh, that's why. Because it's, no, it's, so it's the older one. It's this one. Uh, GL INET. We don't need all that text in it. This is, so in the you'll see the link in the chat. Um, this is the it's an older one, and um, I bought it three years ago. But probably this Wi-Fi antenna, yeah, it's only two point four gigahertz, which is not helping uh, the connection. What's that? Is that a new version? Um, but I had a SIM card stuck into this. I have a second Mint SIM, Mint Mobile SIM. So I was on my Mint Mobile data plan. The SIM card was in the router. So it has an internet connection, it VPN into the studio, and then my phone was connected to that. But yeah, it's only 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi, which was probably the problem. So I need to find a better, better travel router with better Wi-Fi uh, for next year. Audio Hotline says, hey, Aaron, nice hang out with you at NAB. Yeah, you too. It was awesome to see you. Thanks for joining. Thanks for joining the stream today. I had a lot of fun hanging out with people at, at the show, definitely. Who came up with the idea to hold a trade show in the middle of the desert? I know, right? It's a terrible place. <laughs> it's a terrible place. Um, Bailey has to head to bed. Yeah, it's late over there, but see you. Next week. Will they release an A10 Mini 2110 edition? That is, um, I, I was asking that question earlier. I, it, I would not have been surprised if they did. Um, however, I have not heard any rumors of it um, at all. So no idea. No idea at all. It'd be very interesting. Then now there's certainly a lot more 2110 gear. So, um, they probably need to, it probably wouldn't be an A10 Mini, um, but that would be an interesting device for sure. We'll see. Nil says, was there an overarching theme to this year's show? Last year, there seemed to be a lot of virtual production gear, but it seems to have died down a bit, maybe in favor of AI. There was definitely a lot of AI topics in the uh, talk tracks, which I didn't go to because I didn't have that ticket. Um, and a fair amount in the booths, I, honestly, I wasn't as overwhelmed by the AI stuff as I thought I was going to be. Um, but the 
there was still a good amount of virtual production stuff, still a lot of flashy virtual production booths. Uh, they had one set up where they had one guy on a green screen and then the host in a set and two robot cameras which were tracking, which were matching each other. So the robot cameras were doing the same movements. And imagine this is like in two separate locations. That's what this was for is like you have a remote green screen studio and your TV host and you have two cameras which are syncing to each other, syncing each other's camera movements, which means you can put the person on the green screen into the set or the real set virtually and make it look like they're actually there with the camera movements and everything. It was actually really incredible. Um, I feel like the virtual set stuff was um, more less like hype and more uh, more realistic use cases this year. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, what was I talking about? The oh, we were talking about this rig. Okay, so up in the convention center, I had the three cameras. Phone camera worked okay. I do need a better Wi-Fi. Director menu was VPN into the studio, pushing to the local IP address of my Magewell Pro Convert, which was feeding into the ATEM, uh, along with the camera of the rack and a graphic, which then was feeding to Pearl Nano, encoding the three streams. So that's that's kind of the, the rig, the setup for that. And it worked well, and I think I would do that again next year. Um, need to get a better Wi-Fi router with better Wi-Fi so that that connection, that camera can do better. but. Other than that, yeah, it worked pretty well. And I liked having the horizontal stream on YouTube with a little BTS Easter egg and stuff. So that was kind of fun. They need to move it to Anaheim. That would be cool. Yeah. Raul says, random question. Do you think it makes sense to combine a 2ME with a 40 by 40 hub trying to justify the 4ME? Okay, so the big difference between the ATEM and a video hub is the ATEM is um, resyncs all your and scales all your video sources. So the whatever you connect into the ATEM, it's doing frame rate conversion and scaling there. So by the time it's in the video mixer internally, it's all consistent. The what that means is that the outputs are always on. And they're always the same resolution and frame rate. So if you are, um, if you are, if you have like, where where this gets annoying is uh, if you have monitors or if you're pushing out to things that, well, anything, yeah, pushing out to anything. This is the problem with pushing out. It's a problem with the outputs. If you're all in the ATEM, everything is great. So like if you look like any of the screens around here, like that TV, right? On that TV, I can change that very quickly between all these different things, right? So I can say, oh, it's my Apple TV. Oh, it's my Fire TV. Oh, it's my ME1. Oh, now it's a multi-view. And notice there's no flicker and it's all instant, right? So uh, the TV, the reason is because the TV is seeing it as just one video feed. The whole time with the the with the video hub switchers that is more like physically unplugging a cable and plugging it back in so the tv will have to resync so if you give it a signal of a different frame rate uh because you have a 1080 60 thing coming in on on input one and a 1080 30 coming in on another and you switch that in the video hub whatever you're pushing to will have to like resync and and lock into the new signal and it'll take longer. So at best, when you're using a video hub, you get a split second black frame. And at worst, it can be several seconds of switching over. And it totally depends on what you're pushing to also. So for that reason, you don't really want to use the video hub router for live switching during a production when things are on the screen. And it's even it's it's a little bit risky to even use it uh, to switch when they're off screen because just because it can take longer than you you might want or you might have to try again. Whereas if you're doing all of your routing in the ATEM, then like there's no issues at all. 
and that's why like if I if I was using the video hub for this every time I would switch between this or this or this the TV would go like oh searching searching for the new signal what's going on okay there it is right which would just it would be really annoying so that's the big difference between ATEM and a video hub um which again may or may not matter to you so that's but that's the big difference um other difference is obviously um well 2ME has is has a lot of inputs so it's not as much of a problem compared to like an ATEM extreme which has only eight but um Obviously, if you have 40 inputs and you have on the hub, video hub, and the 2ME has only 20, then you can only route 20 to the video hub or to the ATEM at a time. But yeah. Grant says, Blackmagic still sells their smart video hub clean switch, which has resynchronizers to avoid this thought that would have gone away with the new 12G video hubs. I suspect they're not planning on re replacing or um, creating a new version of that. That's my suspicion, uh, because they didn't update it with the new video hubs, and I guess maybe they just still have them around. But I suspect that's not going to continue. I think at the point that you're building in the synchronizers and stuff to make it a clean switch, it's basically an ATEM at that point. So, yeah. Am I using Tailscale for my VPN? Any issues with it? I'm actually using WireGuard right now. I am planning on setting up Tailscale. I have started playing with it. Um, it's much easier. So I'm planning on doing a video about how to do that kind of VPN stuff with Tailscale. Um, it's based on the same stuff, so it'll it, it works the same. Um, but yeah, I it's it's like a management layer around WireGuard essentially. Um, I've been very happy with it. It works well. I was able to get that SRT feed over the VPN just fine. So, yeah. Christopher says, strongly suggest looking at peplink routers can do multiple cellular bonding over them. Yeah, I need to do a better deep dive on the router situation. Do the constellations have an encoder and then to send out SRT or do you have to push the output to a different box? None of the constellations have encoders. So the constellation is just the switcher part. There's no recording or streaming in them. So you have to push out to a hyperdeck for recording or a web presenter for, or ATEM mini for streaming. Do I think Blackmagic will continue updating the ATEM mini extreme with new features? I do. I heard some news, not news, unofficial news that there, there will be some updates coming for it. Um, I suspect that it is, I don't know if it's going to be 2110 or if it's going to be SRT in the ATEM, um, but I suspect there's at least a couple new features being added to the ATEM Mini Extremes. Um, I, last year when I asked about SRT in the ATEM, they didn't say no, but they weren't willing to commit to an answer, but um. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if they do add it. I I suspect it, I think it makes sense. The fact they were able to add it to the web presenter suggests they can probably add it to the ATEM. Um, feature request mix minus. Yeah. That'd be nice. <sighs> Where else is any news about the secret product? And Sven says, what device, what was the one you couldn't talk about before NAB? Unfortunately, I still can't talk about it. It got pushed back. They had to push back the launch for some reason. I don't know why. So hopefully soon. Um, but yeah, it's still secret for now. Was Roland at NAB? If so, what new video products did they have? That's a, an interesting question. I didn't look for them. Were they there? Uh, where's the... Find exhibitors. Booths. 
I don't think they had a booth there. Interesting. Andre says, I vote for a streamer X with more inputs. That would be cool. A streamer X is really cool. I, I didn't really fully understand the capabilities of the streamer X when I saw it at NAB last year. Um, cause I have, again, I still haven't ever used a uh, roadcaster, but it's got the full roadcaster audio processing in it, which can do a lot of audio routing, which makes it super useful, which is why I did that video a couple weeks ago about using it for recording zoom meetings. Uh, cause you can actually do the weird audio and video routing you need with it, uh, to get good recordings of your, of your zoom calls. Um, presentations, not calls. But yeah, the Streamer X is a cool little box for sure. Mostly, a, it's mostly a capture card with the audio processing in it. Here's the here's the video. Um, oh wait, there was a question earlier. I saw which was where did it go? Oh, this is a good point from Christopher, not what I was looking for, but yeah. They really need to dump the built-in Maddie and make a digital I.O. slot and then offer cards like Dante in addition to Maddie. I agree. That would make a lot of sense. Ah, there it is. My team never gets old. Um, did anyone have anything like your presenter micro switcher concept? Okay, so funny story. Um I was uh I was filming stuff and we had our scout going around to the booths, and he was like, hey, uh, Aaron, somebody says they made a product based on your video. And um, I was like, what? I haven't heard of this. And it turns out it's Sprolink, which only a couple weeks ago I did there. I did a live stream demo of the, uh, what was it? The R2, which is a, um, let's see if I have it on here. This one, Neolive R2 Plus, which is the one with a little screen on it. Um, but it's like a four input video switcher, like an A10 mini with a screen on it and it's fine. Um, nothing like super groundbreaking, you know, it's got, it's got what features you'd expect more or less. Um, but they may, may, they also have two devices that they were showing, which, um, I'm, I was very interested in, uh, one of which is literally directly based on the video I uh, I made, which was called like these streaming devices don't exist. And, um, the guy at the booth, this is the diagram from my video. The guy at the booth, uh, actually like had my diagram on his phone and it was like, yeah, we watched this video and then made this device. And, uh, so, okay. So let me back up this, uh, this little box. The, the goal of this box is that um, there is currently no video switcher that can actually be used for um, there's no standalone box that can actually do this, which is I want to be able to have two inputs, a camera and my computer slides, switch between them put them side by side with a background and load in a still graphic for a logo and then stream this and record it as well as output the camera over USB for going into zoom and the slides out HDMI to feed a projector doesn't exist. Um, so I made this little page about it, like, Here's what it's for. Here's what it does. Here's the block diagram. This is inspired by Roland's block diagrams for their switchers. Um, and showing like, okay, HDMI one can be routed. What's well, pass through for one. It can be routed to USB-C. USB-C can also take the, the layout, uh, HDMI can switch between any of them. And you also need a pass through of the HDMI. You need to be able to capture a still image, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, and he built it. So check this out. 
I don't have it here, but I do their little um their little brochure, which got very beat up in my bag. Um Yeah, okay, so Dual 4K camera streaming and recording. Okay, two cameras, mic, computer live streaming, dual. I don't understand what dual platform push flow means, but push to two, oh, two streaming platforms and record to SD. Offline events and online live streaming. This is the one that's basically for, for me. Your computer, your camera, go into the box, you feed a projector, you stream, and you record. And then they also have this one, which is camera, computer, going into the box, the computer screen, stream, record, and online video conference. So this is, let's see, do they have a picture of the, oh, they don't have a picture of the ports on the side. Darn. Um, they just have it listed out. So input, two HDMIs, one USB, output HDMI, and USB. HDMI can be switched between the two inputs as well as the program output. USB-C, uh, oh, it doesn't show that it can be switched, but yeah, it can be switched as well. Anyway, this little box apparently can do this. So um, that is very exciting. I'm gonna hopefully get, it's not like out yet, but they were showing the beta of it there. So. Um, yeah, hopefully I'll, I'll get one in and, uh, be able to actually do a demo of that. Isn't there the major USB fusion product that does that? That one is very close, but there was something about it that makes it not exactly the same. I can't remember now. Turns out the Chinese watch YouTube videos. Um, so they also had this other one, which was, um, they call it, this is a confusing description, but virtual multicam switcher. So what this is, it it's the same kind of box, but it does something totally different, which is basically, it's really hard to see on this. It takes only one input, but it takes a 4K input and then you can create four different crops of that 4K. So they were showing, they were showing, this is not a good demonstration of it, but um, if you have like a side-by-side -side interview setup where of two people, you can then create close-up shots of each person uh, as preset angles. And then when you tap on the different angle, it'll output the crop version over HDMI or USB. So it's like, it's like a video processor. It's not really a switcher and it's only does one input, but I could see that having some interesting uses too. So. Andre says, you know, Aaron, the video I made about Zoom recordings pushed me towards a gigantic setup with the Atom Extreme, Rodecaster Pro 2, Majorl Director Mini, even with Mix Minus and streaming. Oh, cool. Well, we should do a little um, studio tour of that. That'd be kind of fun. The challenge is to sort out the audio from video sources from the ATEM. Yeah, that is always a challenge. Andrew says, wow, I thought the new Rode interview mic was a secret product and was surprised why you have been so excited, but now I know it wasn't the big, big launch. Very intriguing. Um, yep. Yep. Crop 4K region of interest is always interesting to me. That's basically, yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. Do you think it's possible to use a Rodecaster Pro audio in the ATEM Mini without a physical cable, but through some configuration on the computer, would it be possible with the Rode Unify? Rodecaster Pro audio in the ATEM Mini? No, so the ATEM Mini doesn't use anything from the computer except control signals. So, um, yeah, you have to get the audio into the ATEM through some sort of cable. Uh, assuming you're streaming from the ATEM Mini. If you're streaming from OBS or something, then yeah, you can bring your video into the, through the ATEM Mini and audio through the Rodecaster into your computer streaming software. But 
if you're assuming from the atom, then everything has to go into the atom. Um, the one, the one thing that would be, it's not, um, not exactly without a cable, but if you are feeding your computer into the ATEM because you're sharing your screen for some reason, you could then use the Rode Unify to route audio from the Rodecaster out of the HDMI port on your computer into the ATEM that way. So it's not no cable, but it's an HDMI cable instead of an audio cable. Of all the things you saw, what's the one you most want to get in to test? Ooh, that's a tough question. Out of everything I saw, um, I do want to test out the Sprolink switcher, presentation switcher, for sure. Um, I want to do more, I want to do a deeper dive on the Resolve Replay, Instant Replay panel, because especially once they, well, so what they talked about in the keynote, what they had set up was like a 2ME switcher with like four Hyperdex rigged up. I can just find the YouTube video of this. Instagram video. So somewhere in here I show the rack they have set up. Um, so they have four camera angles. It's behind me. Yeah. He did a very good walkthrough of, of it. We had we actually had to record this three or four times. Once where he's just like doing it and I'm filming that way. Once again where we filmed a close-up of the keyboard. Once where we filmed a close-up of the screen. <laughs> Poor guy. He was very nice. Um Okay, so that rack, there's a 2ME, there's, I guess, eight Hyperdex, um, the Ultra Studio 4K to get the video in and out of Resolve. That's not a small rig. Uh, so my question was like, okay, what is the smallest version of this you could do? And the, the answer is... Oh yeah, and they have the they have the forty eight terabyte cloud store cloud store. <laughs> I keep forgetting their names, um, which again is not a cheap or small box. But assuming disk speeds and network speeds are um, sufficient, theoretically you can do this with a Hyperdeck Mini recording to a cloud pod and a the the cheap the small um capture card what's the name of it it's is it also ultra studio it's the uh the little tiny one the this one yeah ultra studio 3G monitor and then you need some sort of Bring your own switch, right? Bring your own network switch for this. They also had their fancy network switch in the rack, um, which is cool, but uh, also not none of it's cheap. But yeah, theoretically, you could do a scaled down version of this and possibly, maybe, there's going to be some updates for other products to make it work with other combinations of things. So I'm really interested in trying that out because this... This stack of gear is like, again, it's not, it's stuff that you might already have for other reasons, but not everybody has eight of the Hyperdex. Not everybody wants to buy a 48 terabyte cloud store. Um, so I wanted to know like, what's the smallest amount of gear you can buy to get into the replay workflow. So that's what I want to try out. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, yeah. Did I get any hands-on with the ATEM Mini control surface they introduced? I did. I got a chance to play with it a little bit. Um, it's cool. It's actually really cool. I was surprised. It is. It was an interesting decision. They made it a Bluetooth 
peripheral, so it talks to a computer and not the ATEM. So it's basically like a specialized keyboard for your computer that controls the ATEM control software. I get why they did it. Kind of wish they had an Ethernet option, though, uh, but I get why they did it. But it does feel very nice and it works well. It's, um, I, could, I could see that making a lot of sense for a lot of people. David says, curious on your thoughts on the Ghost Stream Duet. Oh, yeah. So I actually have it here. They sent me that a while ago, which they didn't want me to mention until now. But they had that at the show. Ghost Stream Duet. Um, I featured that one in a little video. That one is... That one is... Where was it? Was it earlier on? Yeah. So we've done a demo of the OC Ghost Stream before. The Duet has what everybody wants, which is four HDMIs and four SDIs. It's still only four channel, but it's, you can choose each channel, whether you want it to be SDI or HDMI now, which is really, really great because there's so many situations with, even with four inputs where you need to use a mix of HDMI and SDI. And now this thing can do all the conversions for you. I think this is a smart move. So I wish Blackmagic would do this because like, this makes so much sense. Being able to mix and match SDI and HDMI. They really should have made it Ethernet with PoE for power. Oh, the ATEM control service? Yes, I think, yes. <laughs> The growing file thing is still amazing. And I know Alex demoed it and used it on productions. Yeah, it's wild. So the um, the way the resolve replay thing works is the hybrid X of recording to cloud the, the NAS. Resolve is mount, has mounted that NAS. <laughs> Jim. Yes, I agree. This is why I want to get my hands on that panel. I, I think you can sort of demo it without the panel, but it doesn't really make sense without the panel because there's so many specialized buttons on that. But all your hyperdecks are recording to the NAS. Resolve has mounted the NAS folder, and it can watch the files as they grow, and it's playing from the NAS. Like, the video you're seeing in Resolve is coming from the network storage, not, um, not over a video capture card or something. Um, which, how does that work? I don't know how it works so well, but, like, there was almost no delay. So then... Resolve is able to scroll back through the video mounted over the network to play it back, which is wild. Super wild. The new Blackmagic Media Player 10G seems to have a lot of overlap with the Ultra Studio 4K Mini. I, I remember thinking that too. Um, yes, Ultra Studio 4K Mini which is the one I have. Where is the new one? What's it called? Uh, what was it called? Oh my God. Media Player 10G. Where is that? Is it here? I don't know what category it fits into. Oh, it's right there. Um, yeah, because it also has a... Oh, well, the network is different, right? There's no network jack on this one. Why wouldn't you just get this at this point? That's the question. Where's the back of it? I need to see the ports. Why wouldn't you just get that? If you if you were gonna go, if you were looking at the 4K Mini, 4K Mini, yeah, there's no Ethernet on this one. So we have SDI, two outs, in and loop, oh, analog video, which is super relevant. No analog in this one. We do get analog audio. We have two SDIs, and loop out, yeah, if you don't need the analog video, this seems like this is the obviously better choice. 
Um, why wouldn't you get it? Because it's not available till June. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, this seems like this seems like a pretty solid option. Also, you get your 10 gig Ethernet through that, which is useful because. Yeah, that's cool. OK, hmm. interesting. Hmm. Michael says, the last part I need of this I still need to test is the output, but recording to a cloud pod and reading the growing file in Resolve does work. I'm trying to get it all set up on my desk now. Cool. Why don't more manufacturers add PoE to lower power devices? Is it hard to implement? I don't, I know there's just like chips you can get for it, so I don't know why not. Like, really, really everyone should be doing PoE and everything, frankly. Oh, no ref time code on the media player. I missed that one. Yeah. The big thing is a 10 gig port on the player to enable replay to work well. Yeah. I didn't see the Smart V4K in person. I forgot to look at that one. I didn't spend that much time in Blackmagic this time because I was running around so much. Kind of wish I had spent more time, though. Mixing and matching SDI HDMI would be so good. Do you know how much the duet will be? I don't see it on BNH yet. I didn't ask, actually. Uh, I forgot if he told me. Chuck says the duet should be around four or $500. That's a great deal because even just like not having to worry about converters. Jim says, how does the Yellow Box replay feature work compare with the Resolve solution? That's a good question. So both Yellow Box and Magewell now have instant replay features. Um, I did a little demo, a quick demo of the Magewell one in a video last week. Uh, the, or maybe it was two weeks ago. I would say the Yolo Box one is the simplest, easiest, but also least featureful, which makes sense. If you're going to make it simple, like it's going to do less stuff. Um, basically just like, just does, it just kind of goes, right? You get a few more options with, uh, with the, Few more options with the Magewell as far as controlling which things get played back. The Resolve thing is like 20 times more complicated. It's um, more complicated, but way more featureful. So like, if you, where do they have the picture of the keyboard? Resolve, replay editor, yeah. So if you look at all the buttons, this will kind of give you an idea of what I mean. <laughs> Where are the buttons? Where are the buttons? I don't want to show just people playing hockey. Where are the buttons? Oh, that's funny. Those are the clips they had at the booth. I think they're saying you can use it without the, without the editor. Okay, so here's the keyboard. So this is basically like here you have your, your eight camera buttons, right? So if you have eight cameras being recorded, you can, when you set a point of interest with this button, so if something happens, you set point of interest, then that's like on the timeline in Resolve. Uh, so then you can start playing back replays and you can press four seconds. If you hold down four seconds and then press cam one, it'll go to four seconds before that point of interest and start playing that back. And then you can be like, okay, two seconds before cam four and play that back also. You can't do any of that with Magewell or Yolo Box. Like, you can't choose, you can't live edit your replay, basically. So um, that's, the, that's the sort of, that's the big, the big thing. Um, this wheel you can also use to like scroll back through your timeline if you want to like find, if you didn't mark it ahead of time, you can go back and find something and then like mark a point of interest and do your replays. Um, this is 
it's just so much more powerful. Um, plus, you're in Resolve, so while you're doing your your replays live, it's also building a timeline. So, um, I also noticed Auto Stinger mentioned while you were scrolling, assuming there's a button. I wonder if it'll actually work. <laughs> it does. It does actually work. Um, yeah, there's a Stinger feature too. So, in um, if you have a Stinger loaded in Resolve. When you start, when you start and end a replay, it'll run that stinger, and it does actually work with an alpha, with an alpha channel too, which is cool. The media player looks like a Thunderbolt dock with SDI. It even has USB for keyboard and mouse. That's an interesting way to think about it. Yeah. Andre says, it'd be nice if one had a USB audio de-embedding box, like how the Mage Wall takes the audio from the USB port to analog. That'd make a nice add-on to a Rodecaster Pro and ATEM combo. USB audio to analog? Why can't you just output road from the Rodecaster out of an audio jack? I need to get a Rodecaster and play with it. Hopefully they will send me one so I can do some demos. Michael says, I need to buy a new VMix replace laptop for a shoot next month, but I'd really like to just invest in Resolve Replay. If you can get it to work, I think it'll be, I think you'll be happy with it. It's very cool. Oh, I totally missed this earlier. Sorry, Wayne. Um, Got to put Q in front of your question so it filters into my questions column. Um, I was multi-streaming to YouTube and Facebook for three hours. YouTube dropped out after an hour and a half. Facebook kept going. How can I find out why? I did five other live streams that weekend with no issue. Oof. Um, I have bad news. YouTube gives you almost no information <laughs> about this. There's like no feedback in YouTube about what went wrong. They have this little section in here, which is like, it's called stream health, but it doesn't do anything. <laughs> like, it'll tell you your stream is bad when it's not. It'll tell you your stream is good when it's bad sometimes the history just doesn't appear like now like earlier there were messages that were like oh your bit rate's too low don't know where those went uh it's useless no they really need better tools for that but there's like what did i just do i just pressed something that changed what's on the elgato prompter i didn't even know that was a thing No, it's screen mirroring feature. Did I change my display settings with a keyboard shortcut? I did. I didn't know you could do that. Apparently, there's a keyboard shortcut to turn off screen mirroring. Huh. Did not know there was a keyboard shortcut for that. Okay. Well, let's try to not press that. Yeah, sorry, I don't have any any tips for you on the YouTube fail. YouTube fails are the worst, silent and deadly. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully somebody will do a good simple demo of replay resolve replay feature. It is it really does feel like a lot of stuff to cobble together, but um but Yeah. Wayne says there was a slight radio music in the background. That could that be why it got dumped? Usually if it's um if it's just music in the background, usually what'll happen is your uh stream will get flagged as like, oh, there's a copyright issue on it. Um and you won't be able to monetize it. Or they'll take the monetization. But they usually don't like kill the stream just for broadcasting copyrighted music. They will kill the stream if you're broadcasting like somebody else's YouTube stream. Like if you're streaming, don't ever do this. Do not watch the Apple keynote on YouTube and put yourself in a little green screen overlay on the YouTube video and like comment over it. Like that will, that will get your stream taken off the air and your channel might even lose streaming privileges 
for months. Um, if it's just music, they usually don't, they're usually not that aggressive about it. So um, you'll just get a little warning in the console that says you can't monetize it. Andre says, Roadcaster has two USB outs, but you, to, but to capture the audio, you need a device like Magewell, a D and better box to analog and broaden the possibilities. Okay, fair, yeah. Um, or, I feel like US, yeah, USB audio in. Okay, that's the problem, is USB audio in. The Magewell can host, the Magewell and Yellow Box can now bring, can use a USB audio device as an input, which is useful, but yeah. Michael says, I feel like that was a don't ask me how I know moment. <laughs> um, it happened to Joseph a couple years ago, photo Joseph. He lost streaming privileges for a long time. Um, Marine says, yeah, when I want to watch NASCAR, I put it on a TV behind you, behind like you have, and talk to the stream. So it's mostly out of focus and no audio from the race. I would even be nervous about having it in the frame at all, but that's just me. Yeah. Oh, the analog outs of road devices are balanced or headphone. Oh, see, I always forget the ports on the Roadcaster. There's no like line output. Huh. Mevo needs to make a wireless audio interface and a wireless SDI HDMI interface for their Mevo infrastructure. I love to use my own cameras and feed the system audio from an audio console. See, I agree. Um, audio, I hadn't thought of as a separate box. I did tell them at the booth that they really should add a HDMI capture card, wireless HDMI capture card that feeds into uh, into the, into their system because um, that would be that would get us pretty much what we had with the um, with the with the Sling Studio, with the ability to. Because they, the only way to bring cameras into that was with these little capture cards, and you plug in a camera or anything else. But yeah, totally, I agree on the audio one too. Um, so I will say they did one thing they did have there at the booth, which I should have spent more time talking about in the video. Was uh, where is it? How late? Oh, there it is. Um, I should have spent more time on this in this video, but ninety seconds is really tough. Um, they have a new little capture card and it's not wireless, but it is, um, it is a capture card that plugs into the iPad, which means you can now feed, you can mix your wireless Mevo cameras with video or audio from other things if you can bring it into HDMI. So for example, take an A10 mini output, feed that into the capture card into the iPad, and now you can do a full A10 production and mix it with wireless cameras. So just gonna put that out there as a as a option. Um, they had it. The way they were talking about it was, oh, you can use here's here's where I go to add it. You can use a wired web webcam, right? So this is oops, I meant to pause the video, not switch cameras. Now I lost it. The way they were talking about it was, oh, now you can use wired webcams along with your Mevo wireless cameras. But I was like, but doesn't that mean you could also plug in an ATEM over UVC, and now you've got an ATEM switcher mixed in with your wireless Mevos, and now you've got audio inputs on the ATEM or multicam wired, whatever. So, or just a little capture card. You can even just do like, um, yeah, HDMI to, to UVC capture card and bring in any camera that way. It is wired, so I, but I asked them like, you guys should make a wireless one. We'll see what they say. Marine says, finally listen to you and try the EQ on the A10 Mini. My audio chain is about to grow more complicated and I love it. Mix pre three, two into the A10 Mini into Ecamm. Cool. <laughs> Great. Uh, sorry to make things more complicated, but hopefully that also makes it better. The Rodecaster Duo has the front jack. Would that help with the earlier question? Oh, does it? Okay, now I need to go look, look this up. Rode. Oh yeah, the Interview Pro. Cool. Mike, maybe I'll use that for next year. 32-bit onboard recording. 
and it also can be received by the wireless pro receivers or your roadcaster um interfaces roadcaster pro duo oh yeah but isn't what is that jack on the front what is that i assume it's headphones so they have speaker out okay hmm yeah What is the front jack for? Not, not clear. Huh, yeah. And nice thing you know you would go for a Midas MR18. Yeah, it's dangerous, dangerous. Then you go for a 32 when you run out of, when you want Maddie. Banhammer, you say, we'll make a note not to comment on Apple, WWC, or other live streams. Just don't rebroadcast the streams. Frankie says, to extract audio from SDI, I have original Blackmagic to SDI converters, two balanced audio jacks. Very useful when you... Oh, the original SDI to HDMI do have analog audio. I forgot about that. The ports on the front are TRRS. Is that for, like, uh, headphones, like a headset mic? Makes sense. Okay. Don't forget to give this stream a thumbs up and like and subscribe. Um, I will hopefully post videos, uh, the recap videos that I post on Instagram in horizontal format uh, soon. Don't know how fast I can get to editing those into horizontal formats, but we'll see. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, hopefully, hopefully you can go at least go watch them on Instagram. Um, what else? Okay, what do we see there? We have Road, Obspot, OC, Hollyland coming in with their wireless camera that doesn't exist again. They've made some tweaks to it. Um, oh, the iFootage monopod was cool. Um, oh, I totally forgot about X keys and central control. That was some cool stuff too. Um, the I was excited about that. So the, where was it? X keys, um, I haven't I haven't bought any of this stuff before, but they just launched this new RGB line, which is cool. And uh, the other thing at their booth was Central Control is working on running the ATEM control protocol inside this board so that it's a standalone box, which again is like, that's what I want on, on a shoot is now you don't have to bring a pie running companion and, um, the, because this box just talks straight into the ATEM, which is very cool. Also, John made a cameo at the booth, which was fun to see. <laughs> I told him I would send him some video of me sitting in front of a screen talking uh, as well. So I'll be at the next booth, hopefully. But yeah, that was very cool to see this control surface for um, for the ATEM built into. Brandon said, did I watch any of the office hours coverage at NAB? No, I didn't have any time to watch anything else, any other coverage of NAB. But they had some cool stuff. They were like, had a whole rig with a with a monitor on the front so that the person they were talking to could see all the Zoom participants, which was cool. Also, they were using gear that is far out of the budget of most people for that, that was like on loan to them. Um, but it was very cool. Wayne's spot on the map is not showing up. Why not? Say hello from Australia. You have to say hello from, otherwise it doesn't work. Did I see the Neola Live box cam? Yeah, I checked it out again. Um, the, the new one they had here was the one with wireless in it. So I was supposed to take one with me and I completely forgot. So I don't have it here. Uh, but I might, I might get one in at some point, um, maybe after they're launched. Definitely a cool, uh, cool idea. It's, 
I'm curious to know about the possibilities for integrating it with other kinds of things to control other than just the Yola box. Um, Cause I know they have control software in the Yola box for it, but cause there's like no screen, no buttons. So. Ah, there's your hello from Australia, Southeast. Now you're on the map. There we go. The moon is not on the map, Raul. <laughs> Brandon says, I bought an OC Ghost Stream. I have the Scarlet Solo third gen. What's the best way to get that into the Ghost Stream? Scarlet Solo third gen. Let's see what one this is. Um, this is what's on the back. Line outputs left and right. So that will go into the ghost stream. So you can get a, um, oh, we have Inix 3D from Cyprus joining. Let's see if that shows up on the map soon. Oh, you got to say hello from, not hi from. I should add hi from also. <laughs> Darn. Um, okay, so if you take your quarter inch left and right, you can get a cable that will turn that into a stereo eighth inch. And then uh, that will go into the ghost stream and set your ghost stream to line input level. And that should work. But yeah, you could, because you've got the line outputs on the focus right, that should work great. Oh, and we have Mark from Perth, Australia. Fantastic. A little bit better time difference there, I think. Michael says, fun fact, Aaron uses Amazon Mechanical Turk workers to power them up just like Amazon's AI stores. No, no. It is, uh, it is my, my computer workers. Um, I went into one of those Amazon stores on this last trip. It was weird um, because it really is, you just, you just swipe your credit card to go in, you just pick stuff off the shelves, put it in a bag and walk out. And then you get charged later. And I was like, okay, how is this working? And I was looking on the shelves. I'm like, are there little NFC tags everywhere? Uh, and like sensors on, on the things I'm picking up? No, not at all. Uh, and then I looked up and it was just, the ceiling is just full of cameras. Like cameras, I have to show you a picture of this. It was out of control. Oh, there we go. Now we got Cyprus on the map. Uh, <laughs> um, no, it was seriously, it was out of control how many cameras there were. Where is my photo of that? It was before NAB. So it was, it was before NAB. Let's mirror my screen. Or any be on my way between between trips. I stocked up on a bunch of snacks for Vegas, which was absolutely the right call. There it is. Okay, so um, where's my? Does that work? Yep. So this was looking up. Look at how many cameras. They're just everywhere. Cameras everywhere. Like it's outrageous how many cameras there were up there. And I was like, there's, there's no way that this actually works with, with AI. And I did a little digging and it turns out they're shutting the whole thing down because, um, they're shutting the whole program down because it's apparently not working out because the AI doesn't get accurate enough to actually process things most of the time. And they end up with humans reviewing all the footage to figure out what to charge you. Yeah. How delayed was your receipt email? That was the dead giveaway for if your trip was processed by a human. Mine was several days later. Actually, now that I think about it, I don't think I actually got the email. I just finally saw my credit card charge show up several days later. Um, what's it called? Amazon 
Let me see if it went to my spam. Oh, there's a lot of stuff in my spam from NAB. Whoops. Um, nope, nothing. Nothing in spam. Did I delete it? It would have been like April. Uh, what date is that photo from? 13th. Um, interesting. Amazon, what was it called? Just walk out. Well, I don't have anything in my email called Amazon for this. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think I ever got a receipt for that. So I just got a charge on my credit card. Interesting. Maybe I should dispute the charge and see what happens since I didn't get a receipt for it. They said they were going to send a receipt. Um, anyway, <laughs> the ceiling is more camera than ceiling. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, while I have my phone connected, what else can I, what else can I show? Oh, I just have little random B-roll clips of, of filming uh, the interviews. This was when we were filming the one with Armando. Um, isn't there some consumer protection law about not getting a receipt? I think there is. It should show up as an order on the Amazon site. Oh, that's an inter interesting idea. I used to get my Whole Foods receipts. Um, they weren't showing up in my order history, but if you search for an item that you bought like an apple, not a good one to search for, uh, an orange, um, you would see your Whole Foods receipts in there, but they that got unlinked for some reason. Um, but let's see, do I have anything? No, I don't have anything in my Amazon purchase history either. Let's see, Amazon, oh, maybe it's in, maybe it's in the local store orders section. Nope, nothing there. Yeah. You mentioned monetizing on YouTube. I need to learn more about that. Have you done a video on it? No, I haven't really talked about the YouTube business stuff side of YouTube here on this channel much. Um, I could. I feel like there's a ton of other channels that specialize on that, though. Um, there's just basically like there's a threshold of number of watch hours and subscribers before you can monetize. Um, and then once you hit that, your channel is monetized. And then you have to worry about doing things with your videos. Well, you should always worry about doing things in your videos that would demonetize you. It's just that unless you're actually making money, you won't really notice any other side effects. But, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, I met Tom Buck there. That was fun. I hung out with Tom a bunch at the show. <laughs> uh, let's see. The, oh, the little globe thing is wild. Uh, this was on the on the train ride monorail line. They had it set to show like the moon at one point, which was very cool. I think it's cool. Uh, to be fair, they have tons of footage to counter your dispute. <laughs> it's true. It's true. But hey, if they didn't send me a receipt and they have to, isn't that their problem? Where am I'm looking for anything else that's fun to share? Tom says B and H flew him out. Did you get a deal like that? 
That was super cool of BH. I I know. I was surprised to hear that. Um they just like offered to fly him him out and pay for his pay for his trip, uh just to to mention BH in his recap videos, which is very smart of them, honestly. Um I did not get a deal from BH like that, but I did get paid because I was doing the the news stories for for the Animos project. So yeah, my my trip was covered, but it was more like a regular like contract, like a regular project, not a not a like sponsorship deal. Is it is there a difference? I don't know. Um, I guess I guess the difference was mine had a much more much more clearly defined expectations and outcomes, uh, whereas B and H did not. But yeah. Um, it is. I, I do appreciate Atomos and the other sponsors um, for for funding that whole project because it is a lot of work, and we did also have to bring in two more crew to help run it this year, which was uh, great that we did that. Yeah, my phone is either the the videos, the edited videos that I posted to Instagram, random pictures of people at booths. Oh, I found this. I think this was. I think Tech Condo took this picture of this is the only BTS photo I have of me doing interviews. Um so thanks, Petra. Uh or it's pictures of the cats that Lily sent me. Uh and then I got home. Then then I got to entertain my cats by playing stick toy with them and uh, filming them in slow motion doing very, very tall jumps. Almost, almost overshot that one. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, and then dealing with house stuff. Speaking of Atomos, any thoughts on the Ninja phone? I didn't really get to play with that much. Um... I should. I should. That's a cool. That's a good idea. Tom got super emotional about his visit to NAB. I watched his recap video. Yeah, it was. Um, I'm glad he had a good time. He was only there for like, I think, two or was it three days? Um, Sunday, Sunday, Monday. He definitely wasn't there on Wednesday. Yeah, I, I wish he could have been there longer. There was so much stuff to see, but glad he had a good, good time. First year is always overwhelming, just because it's like you don't know what to expect. It's huge. Um, but yeah, I had a good time. Okay, what I think I think that's I think that's about it for the for this week. Um, the <laughs> I can. <laughs> I've flown in and out the night before, and it's wild seeing it from the plane. Uh, I can imagine it being distracting for pilots. Uh, so I, I don't remember who it was. I was chatting with somebody about it, and I was like, "Oh yeah, I saw it showing like the moon the other day." And they were like, "Oh, that makes more sense." Oh, it was somebody who was coming from Australia, so like super jet lagged by that point, and uh, they were they were like. I was really confused about why the moon looked so big and was so low in the sky. <laughs> uh, yeah. What just beeped? Something just beeped. I didn't know I had any devices that made that sound. Interesting. Yeah, anyway, moon on the moon on the floor of Vegas, which is confusing. But that thing is I think is so bright. I ha I haven't been inside of it yet, but maybe I need to do that next next time I'm there. I try not to go very often, but I end up there multiple times a year at this point. Not my favorite place in the world, for sure. Uh yeah, okay, well, oh. <laughs> One thing I'm annoyed about about uh I did this video at the Elgato booth. Oops, that's not the right that's not the right super source. Um, that's the right super source. I did this video at the Elgato booth of um, 
face cam and the prompter, which like I've talked about before and I have, I don't have the face cam too, but I bought their prompter, which I'm using for this. Um, and then the day after NAB, they announced <laughs> the new, their whole new line of products, tiny stream deck, capture card, microphone, camera, and light all in white. And I was like, are you kidding me? Why couldn't you have had that at NAB? I wanted to see that in person. And um, yeah, so they're also like much more affordable. They're definitely going after like a new not gamer market with these. Uh, I can't wait till this gets companion support because it's got this little screen down there, which is cool. Could show some useful stuff on that. Uh, they're reasonably priced. So yeah, uh, cool. But like, come on, why couldn't you have had those at NAB? We were right there, I had a booth. I did an interview at the booth. I didn't mention it. Yeah. Maybe they just thought saw it as a different target market, but like on the other hand, Amaran uh, had, a, had a booth there in, in the Aperture booth, but they're like doing a more formal split on the, um, they're doing a more formal split on, on their two brands including internal reorgs of like the, the, the teams and the Amaran line is now like just for creators and the Aperture line is for like film large productions. Um, and it was very well demonstrated by their, their sets they had at the Amaran corner, which was like a streamer set up in like fun colors and that kind of stuff. So um, they clearly thought they could target the the like streamer crowd at NAB creator crowd so I don't know why Elgato had the prompter there and then didn't do their launch at NAB yeah I still have to make gear recommendations to clients of all price points yeah it makes makes sense now there's like some Elgato gear that's even more affordable Steven says, this is the first live stream of yours I've joined. Well, thanks for joining. Uh, do you have a video on how all the different inputs end up on screen, the iPhone, the time, and the weather on screen, et cetera? Um, kind of. I haven't done like a how I do my live streams video in a while, but my latest studio tour video does go over a lot of it. Um, that's probably the best one to watch. It's relatively recent too. So yeah, it's only a month ago. So I'll drop that link in the chat. Um, it's long, I will warn you. So there's a lot there. It's an hour and 10 minutes. It's called my extremely over-engineered live streaming studio. <laughs> uh, so have fun with that. Uh, but yeah, some good, good, good stuff in there. I do, I should, it should have enough to, to get the idea. Um, it is a lot of stuff built up very slowly over time. Um, not something that is just quickly thrown together, but the whole goal of the channel is so I can show you smaller scale gear that you can just set up quickly for doing shows and get similar results. I just, once you're trying to show four or eight input switchers, um, on stream, I was, I was describing this to other YouTubers at NAB and they were like, oh, I hadn't even thought about that. But like, if I'm doing a video about a switcher, I need a talking head shot, and then I need my I need cameras into the switcher so I can switch video and not just switch nothing. Ideally, one of those would be the same as my talking head shot, so I can like have a sh I can cut from this shot to this video inside of a switcher. So now I need a copy of it there. I need some other angles to show you what's on the table, but also probably those go into the switcher too, so I can demonstrate switching those. And then now, so now I need copies of all my cameras everywhere. Um, and it kind of just explodes from there. And that was breaking a lot of people's brains. Cause like, if you're used to just filming one camera and maybe a top down for a video, it's a lot simpler. <laughs> um, Michael says, why wouldn't the Neo stuff be compatible with companion? Um, because so companion actually has to like, create sometimes they work without special configs but um like there's different number of buttons on that screen so companion needs to know how many buttons there are 
And that means like it needs to know the product ID of the product and what that means. So when you plug in over USB, it knows like, oh, I actually understand how to talk to this device and it's not just some random device. So if you look at the the source code for companion, you'll find like the list of all the stream decks that are supported in it somewhere. And um, the, uh, so yeah, that's, that's why. And then plus with that little tiny screen on it, that's like a totally new thing that, that doesn't exist in companion right now at all. Right? Like that shape of a screen and showing text on that doesn't exist in companion at all. So that's going to take some new, new stuff. Um, but yeah, it'll be, it'll be cool. Steven says, I have an ATEM Mini Extreme ISO that I've been happy with and interested in getting more for live streams, upstream, downstream keys, et cetera. Yeah, well, there will there should be some tips in there for that, but but yeah. Recording only is for sure different than live. I'd imagine even more so if you're both host and crew. Yeah, right. And I'm also, yeah, not only doing recorded videos, but also doing live demos of these switchers. So it it explodes. That's why this studio is such a mess. Which I still want to figure out a solution to, but that's a different um a different problem did i mention a new prompter face something it's elgato's prompter it, they just call it prompter um let's see it's in where is it capture cameras prompter this is the one i have at the desk up here it's a usb monitor down here mounted to this mirror that's all one thing it's not you can't take it apart um so it's like the simplest way to get a teleprompter into your computer because you plug it in, your computer sees it as a second screen. You can mirror or extend your desktop, that kind of stuff. Uh, no HDMI in on this. Uh, so it's, yeah, that's the big difference with this is that there is no HDMI input on this prompter. It is just for a computer monitor, which is, I wish they at least would have had an option of switching it to HDMI in. Um, but they're go they're clearly going after like, one particular use case with this. So that's fair, right? Um, it is a USB monitor. End of story. Um, but yeah, I wish they would have added the HDMI input. Anyway, the... Oh, there's Tom. <laughs> he did a good he did a good video on this one. Do I have any videos showing my world map setup? No, because it's not something that is re really repeatable. Um, Yeah. Companion also has a Stream Deck plugin, so you, you could go the other way around. Oh, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought about that. I don't, <laughs> I don't use my Stream Deck this way because it's plugged into a Raspberry Pi, so I never run the Stream Deck software on the computer. But yeah, you're right. If you're running the Stream Deck software on a computer, you could add your companion buttons that way. Great point. I always forget about that. Um, oh, I, funny. I do actually have Stream Deck software running on my computer. Oh, I think I was starting to add a Stream Deck and then I got distracted with it. So somewhere in here, I don't think I have the companion thing installed, but you can you can add a companion button like there. I don't like doing it that way just because it's harder to manage, but um, that would certainly work with this new one for now. Michael also forgot about that. Okay, we're going to wrap this up. It's been two hours. Oh my gosh. Um, I need to go. I need to go. What do I need to do? I should probably film something so I can get a video out this week. I don't know what I'm going to do about NAB videos. We'll see. Um, plus, I need to clean the house before Lily gets back. It's funny. We crossed paths on my way home. She left for Chicago for a conference Wednesday afternoon, and I got back Wednesday evening. So we didn't have to get a cat sitter, which is nice. Um, they just had no humans in the house for a couple hours, which is not that unusual. Um, but now I need to go clean up and actually finish unpacking. I literally haven't even unpacked from the trip yet. I still have my backpack full of stuff, so I should probably fix that soon. Um, and then get, I want to redo my studio again and move the table around. But I don't have a good solution for that. So that's going to be a different different day, I think. All right. Thanks everybody for joining. Thanks to all the channel members for your support. Uh, thanks for the questions. Thanks for joining the stream. Don't forget to like and subscribe. 
Thanks, Eric, for the reminder, as always. Um, do go watch my videos on Instagram if you uh, want to see the rest of my coverage. I I hopefully will have some of the these out on YouTube this week. We will see. Otherwise, um, yeah, they're all up on, on Instagram right now if you don't mind watching them before. Uh, yeah, otherwise, uh, hopefully I'll get some of this gear in to test soon. I uh, will do a demo of the OC, OC stream, Go Stream Duet because I have that one already. But I want to get some of the other stuff, get my hands on some of the other stuff. I'll try to put together a Resolve replay demo too um, because that's going to be so cool. Uh, assuming that we can get it down, scaled down so you don't have to buy eight Hyperdex and spend $20,000. But yeah, anyway, we'll get there. We'll get there. Thanks for watching, thanks for joining, and see you all again next week. Bye.